the, the public media roundtable is a project of the Center for Social Media. So I'll do a little genealogy here. The Center for Social Media is founded by Pat Alster Heidi. Pat, raise your hand. A prominent and prolific film critic, social critic, um, telecommunications expert, writer, and uh, and I've been working with her at the center, and we have uh, were blessed with this gift from the Ford. Found I'm not going to use this. Uh, we got this grant from the Ford Foundation. Is Becky on here? That, um, to allow us to do, to develop a think tank to look at the future of public media. And uh, this is one of those projects. Part of what we've been doing for the past day and a half is a, and David and Bethany can explain about this, I'm sorry. We've had a meeting of uh, people who are working in the blogosphere and the new citizen media, that kind of rowdy public that has now become loud and often gets in the middle of everything. And people in public broadcasting are looking at ways to intersect the two. So for the past day and a half, we've been looking at questions of well, what is this thing, public media? And what is this public? And what is this new space that's emerging? What are its dangers and what are its promises? So a lot of this conversation has been going on, and I, I'm afraid I can report that we didn't come up with any firm conclusions, or I would tell you right now what we figured out. So we're still in the midst of figuring this out, and we invite you to be part of this conversation. Talk with us, email us, look at our website, and, uh, and interact with us and figure this out. Is this any better yet? It's better? Okay. Um, so let me introduce our speaker. I could, I'm, I have a nice bio here. I'll wait to you in a moment. But the shorthand one is uh, what I heard from Wick Rowland, who's a general manager in Denver. He said, well, David Learoff is the guru of public broadcasting. He's who we go to to, uh, to think about what's on the horizon and what are the what uh, are the issues? And we think so broadly and globally about technology and politics and economics and business research in these unconventional ways. So he's really quite a prolific and uh, activist thinker. We've been blessed to have him in the room for the past day and a half. So here are the, the, the more formal things besides being a guru. Of course, he is the VP and Chief Technology Officer at one of the premier public television stations in the country, WGBH, GBH in Boston. And he has um, he served on many boards uh, in public television more broadly. He's been with WGBH since 1979 and has um, done uh, management responsibilities for broadcasting, local local program production, creative services, membership, major gifts, and capital campaign fundraising. <coughs> and he's been speaking all over the country and, um, and has collected quite a amassed quite a, a body of interesting essays and speeches on where the public media sector is going. So I'm very honored to have him here. I'd like you all to welcome David Zero. Thank Thanks, Noel. We have uh, help on the way from whoever does the House AV, so this should be a problem that will, will solve itself. Uh, I've been here for the last day and a half in one of the most provocative conversations I've been in in years, the essence of which is where is the intersection between the traditional public broadcasting establishment and the emerging world of the blogs, the blogosphere, and other new media as well. And just to set appropriate expectations, as Noel suggested, we didn't come up with the answers yet. So this is a conversation in which everyone is enthusiastically invited to participate. Uh, just to catch you up for those in the room who were a part of these conversations for the last day and a half, uh, I was struck in those conversations by the extent to which our conceptual approaches to issues involving public media continue to be shaped by our understanding of the world as we have known it in the past. In this context, we use terms like commercial or non-commercial, for-profit, not-for-profit, community and public and the public interest because based on our own experiences and the experiences of those who have come before us, we think we know what we mean more or less when we use those words. And one of the key questions still very much on the table is what does the term public media mean? And I don't have the answer here, so just 
don't walk out of the room and say he never answered that question. I'm telling you right now, I don't have the answer to that question. In the medium is the massage. Marshall McLuhan quipped that when faced with When Marshall McLuhan quipped in the medium is the massage that when faced with a totally new situation, we tend almost always to attach ourselves to the objects or to the flavor of the most recent past. We look at the present through a rear view mirror. We march backwards into the future. And much of our conversation was based, understandably, on our own, the, own, the experiences all of us brought into these conversations. It's, it's difficult to appreciate the extent to which our experiences growing up shape the way in which we see the world today. My mother was born in New York City in 1910. She remembered cooking with coal, having gas lights in the house. She went on to be one of the first women to be graduated from the B Brooklyn Law School straight into the teeth of the Depression. You flash forward several decades, and years later, I was living in Chicago. She was still living in New York. She came to visit me, but instead of flying, she took the train. It arrived on, in Chicago 17 hours later on time. And when I met her at the station, I said, Mom, you know, you could have flown. It would have taken less than three hours to get here. And she said, yes, but it should take 17 hours to get from New York to Chicago. Pretty clear in her world that you didn't travel unless you spent some time doing it. And you compare that with my daughter, Brooke, whose best friend in the fifth grade was the daughter of a Swedish doctor who was doing medical research at one of the Boston area medical schools. And when the school year ended, the family went back to Sweden, and for the next year, Brooke and her friend Cecilia stayed in touch by phone. This was in the mid-80s before the internet. And then Cecilia invited Brooke to come to visit her to Sweden. And I thought that was a very exciting adventure for a sixth grader, or so I thought. We made the arrangements for her trip. I asked her if she'd be interested in seeing where Sweden is on the map. And she said, nope. And I said, come on. She said, no, no, no. I pick up the phone. I dial the number. Cecilia's on the other end. You tell me that when I get on the plane, I stay on it for eight hours, and it gets to Stockholm, I get off, and Cecilia and her family will pick me up. Why do I have to know where it is? <laughs> my mother and my daughter, two travelers with very different concepts of distance and time, and I suspect that Brooke invented cyberspace before William Gibson coined the term. Uh, one more on this theme. Uh, Larry Grossman introduced me to a book called Today Then. You ought to get it if you don't have it. It's a collection of essays written on the occasion of the 1893 World's Fair in Chicago by 74 prominent Americans, each of them predicting what the United States would be like over the next 100 years. Here's one of my favorites. David Swing, a Chicago preacher, anticipated modern air travel. Here's what he wrote in 1893. It's almost certain that the United States will continue to advance in the next 100 years. Considerable traveling will be done by the air route. The fact that air is an ocean which will float a man settles the question of aerial navigation. Man has simply to invent the kind of boat. It must be very large and strong. And this boat may be guided from city to city by a wire strung about 100 feet above the ground so to let the balloon pass over the trees and the houses. And thus a wire one quarter of an inch in diameter will hold and guide many balloons full of people. And for those of us uh, like me yesterday who continue to be frustrated by weather delays at airports, it sounds like a pretty neat idea, actually. <laughs> well, if it's not already apparent, I'm going on about this because right now we need to acknowledge that our understanding of our world and of the fundamental structure and organization of our societies, our governments, our economies, our nation states, you can keep the list going ad infinitum, is based on largely on one immutable premise, that geographic distance 
was an absolute barrier to instantaneous interpersonal communication. Our whole notion of democracy, of nation states, of the way in which members of the public communicate with each other, depends upon the use of, and I'll use the word in its specific sense, media, those intervening uh, facilitators that convey meaning from one user to another. They're interveners, they're intermediate elements, and with a deliberate play on words, the media as we know them are being disintermediated by new disruptive technologies. And yet all of our discussions assume the role of media in the world today. And the very meaning of that term, whether we can agree on what public media means or not, is premised on a technological factor which is no longer relevant, that geography is a barrier to instantaneous human communications. Marshall McLuhan remarkably had this pretty well nailed about 40 years ago, and I have to confess that I was teaching McLuhan at Ohio University in the early 70s. I barely understood what he was talking about, and now it seems so clear. In the medium is the massage, he wrote, and he used the term electric circuitry to refer to electronic media. He wrote, electric circuitry has overthrown the regime of time and space and pours upon us instantly and continuously the concerns of all other men. It has reconstituted dialogue on a global scale. Its message is total change, ending psychic, social, economic, and political parochialism. The old civic, state, and national groupings have become unworkable. Nothing can be further from the truth and the spirit of the new technology than a place for everything and everything in its place. You can't go home again. And later, and you may know this quote, ours is a brand new world of all at onceness, one word. Time has ceased, space has vanished. We now live in a global village, one of the first uses of that term, a simultaneous happening we have begun again to structure the primordial feeling, the tribal emotions from which a few centuries of literacy divorced us. We've had to shift our stress of attention from action to reaction. We must now know in advance the consequences of any policy or action since the results are experienced without delay. Because of electric speed, we can no longer wait and see. George Washington once remarked, he goes on, we haven't heard from Ben Franklin in Paris this year. We should write him a letter. So how could McLuhan have been so foresighted? Well, it turns out he was a student of a Jesuit, French Jesuit peace, priest and paleontologist named Pierre Teilhard de Chardin, whose name some of you may know. And from the 1920s to the 1950s, de Chardin wrote about evolution and theology and the global ecosystem. And McLuhan quotes de Chardin directly in the Gutenberg Galaxy. This is Chardin talking. Through the discovery yesterday of the railway, the motor car and the airplane, the physical influence of each man, formerly restricted to a few miles, now extends to hundreds of leagues or more. Better still, thanks to the prodigious biological event represented by the discovery of electromagnetic waves, each individual finds himself henceforth actively and passively simultaneously present over land and sea in every corner of the earth. And McLuhan then went on to popularize de Chardin's idea as the global village. The guy knew how to market an idea. But it goes further than that. De Chardin introduced the idea of global consciousness, a membrane, as he described it, a membrane of information which enveloped the globe, which he called the newosphere, N-O-O-S-P-H-E-R-E. -E. And if you think this is beginning to border on the paranormal and the weird, weird uh, stay with me. I won't go too far with it. Uh, the Greek word for mind is new, N O O. And there was a Wired magazine article about de Chardin, and John Perry Barlow is quoted as observing, with cyberspace, we are, in effect, hardwiring the collective consciousness. On the radio open source website, and Brendan Greeley is here from the open source 
production team. If you click on Chris Lydon Explains, you'll read Chris's assertion that one of the unspoken reasons we're drawn to the internet is that it realizes so many of our primal old def definitions of God. It's invisible, it's everywhere, it knows everything. Sing it now, it's got the whole world in its hands. Its eye is on the sparrow, paraphrase, par paraphrasing the Ethel Waters song, and I know it watches me. Why else do we keep Googling ourselves if not to be reminded that the internet who's, knows who I am and who you are too? The internet, so closely resembling the newest fear that Teilhard de Chardin foresaw 50 years ago, marks a new stage of human evolution. We do not begin to see the dimensions of the new reality. Now, as I said, I will admit that all of this seems pretty far out and off the point until we attempt to accommodate the explosive growth of social networking and the blogosphere within a comprehensive understanding of what we're calling public media. Surely under the heading of global consciousness, we would include instant messaging and RSS feeds and the Global Voices website, which allows you to put an ear onto the world no matter where you are. Rebecca McKinnon from Global Voices is here with us. And gather.com and myspace.com and friendster and backfence.com and Flickr and even the increasingly ubiquitous Craigslist, to name a very few of today's examples, as well as ubiquitous always-on cell phones and gaming on a real-time global scale. I've been talking to some younger GBH staffers about their use of these social network sites and services. And it's not an exaggeration to tell you that for some of them, particularly those in their mid to middle, late 20s, they are addicted to these services. They can't stay off them. They always want need to check in to see who's talking to them or about them or communicating with them, and that goes with the constant use of the cell phone. And please understand, I'm not being critical here. I'm observing a kind of behavior which their colleagues over 30 simply don't participate in. And they think it's a, a little strange, but they understand what's going on, that the generational divide, if you will, cuts across the introduction of these new social networks as sharply as the digital divide separates some constituencies from others. And I've discovered that even eBay plays a role here. If you go to the eBay homepage and you click on community values, you'll get a statement of eBay's community values which are intended to guide behavior in their chat rooms. eBay is a community that encourages open and honest communication among all its members. We are guided by five fundamental values. We believe people are basically good. We believe everyone has something to contribute, and I think parenthetically, and something to sell. <laughs> We believe that an honest, open environment can bring out the best in people. We recognize and respect everyone as a unique individual, and we encourage you to treat others the way you want to be treated. Sounds pretty public-spirited to me. I came onto this because my wife collects a particular kind of inexpensive glassware made by Fenton Glass of West Virginia, and through eBay she's connected with others who have, forgive me, the same obsession. I build the shells, she buys the glass, and their communication has gone beyond glassware to comparing notes with each other about their lives, including one woman with whom she connected around Fenton Glass who lives uh, about 10 miles down from a hog, a hog farm in central Indiana and who reports that it's not so bad if the wind isn't blowing in the wrong direction. Well, as Noel said, for the past several years I've been making presentations to a variety of audiences about the principal drivers of technological change in the media environment. And my basic point has been that although there is a great deal of uncertainty ahead, the direction of these technological changes, at least in the near to midterm, is abundantly clear. And we ought to check back with each other in five years and see if this all turns out to be true. I believe that none of us should be surprised by what will happen in the next several years. And while, as Bill Gates has observed, 
we have a tendency to overestimate the speed with which technology innovations will unfold and to underestimate their eventual impact, in recent months we appear to have arrived at a tipping point at which the rate of change in the media environment is accelerating exponentially. And any of you who are closely involved in the media environment know that from one day to the next, you never know what's going to break. And I have been thinking about installing a seat belt on the chair in my office. <laughs> we are, at the very least, at what Intel Chairman Andy Grove has referred to as a strategic inflection point. It's that point in the life of an individual or an organization or a corporation at which fewer and fewer of the old rules apply. And you know if you continue to play by the old rules, failure is almost certain. The problem is that the new rules haven't been written yet. And so you are living in free fall without knowing exactly where the sides of the road are or with any degree of certainty what course is most likely to be successful. What I do when I do these pre presentations, I then review a punch list of technological changes, all of which are familiar to most of you, and virtually 100% certain to occur. Uh, Moore's law is still working. Computer processing power doubles every 18 months, as he predicted, with no increase in cost. The cost of digital storage is dropping by half every 10 months. I walk around now with a gigabyte of flash memory in my pocket, the price of which was dropping even as I was buying it at Staples. If I had stood there for another few hours, they would have put it on the end cap and on sale. There seems to be some place there, a, a, a joke about carrying a gigabyte of storage in my pocket, but, uh, <laughs> or you're just happy to see me. <laughs> uh, Advances in audio and video compression continue and very much affect the nature of the media that are in use in the blogosphere. We're able to squeeze increasing amounts of information down same-sized pipes or channels. And again, these are all obvious, nothing brilliant here. The conversion from analog to digital technologies results in an eight-fold increase in cable channel capacity. So they can fit eight digital channels where they're now sending one analog channel. And as you may know, with digital television broadcasting, a fourfold increase in broadcast channel capacity and similar gains by at least double in the digital radio, now so-called HD radio arena. We've got direct-to-user satellite services providing an ever-increasing number of content choices and digital file formats and the shift to internet protocol facilitate cross-platform exchanges from cell phone screens to giant HD TV displays and everything in between. The bandwidth available to end users continues to increase with broadband penetration now in approximately 50% of all U.S. homes. There continues, as everyone in this room knows, to be an inexorable and irreversible shift from wired to wireless technologies. There are emerging developments relevant to this conversation in nanotechnology, in miniaturization, radio frequency ID chips, RFIDs, in retail and media applications, all accompanied, equally importantly, by increasingly sophisticated database management and data mining capabilities which enable personalization, customization, search, collaborative filtering, recommender systems, Others who bought this book also bought these five. Netflix suggesting to me what DVDs I should rent from them based on my other purchases and being right 80% of the time. So I end up seeing movies I never even heard of, and they said I'd like them, and damn it, they were right. <laughs> uh, we could keep going with this. The rest of the list uh, is equally obvious. So it's at this point when I'm talking to public broadcasters and people in related cultural heritage institutions, as they're now called, museums, libraries, archives, universities, and that's a, that's a, a legitimate term of the art, have even a brief conversation with the Institute of Museum and Library Services and find out where the crossover is where pub between public broadcasters, and mu museums, and libraries and you will immediately stumble across the term cultural heritage institutions because we share many of the same challenges, particularly in preservation, digitization, and the like. 
but I focus on the impact of these changes on how we use media for entertainment and information and education and talk about how we're coming to expect that we'll be able to access whatever content we want, whenever we want it, on whatever display devices are most convenient, and these are familiar themes to most of you, and they essentially are elaborations, to borrow from McLuhan, on the flavors of the present and the most recent past. So what? I mentioned yesterday in our conversations that the Corporation for Public Broadcasting has been supporting a year-long scenario planning process whose principal focus is to try to envision the role of the local public television station in the emerging media environment. And among the principal drivers of change going into the future are the expectations of audiences. And in the words of Clayton Christensen of the Harvard Business School, who wrote The Innovator's Dilemma and The Innovator's Solution, which I would put on your list if you're interested in media technologies, Christensen asks, what's the job they're hiring us to do? What are the expectations of those that we are charted to serve? Well, that fifth grade daughter I mentioned a few minutes ago is now grown up out of college, married, expecting her first child in April. And I can only begin to imagine what role public media could or should play during the lifetime of this new arrival as all of us take our first baby steps toward this new global consciousness. We're in the first nanoseconds of this new era and all of us should be sobered by that Bob Dylan refrain, something is happening here, but you don't know what it is, do you, Mr. Jones? Boy, talk about a research agenda. Thank you. I, I, I can't, I literally don't know the significantable pattern that more and more narrow interests will be served because the technology can do it if, if, if they can find the appropriate business model uh, to keep these new services viable. But we're going to see these emerging, I think this is hardly brilliant insight, by the dozens and the, and the, the challenge for those who invest in these companies is to figure out which ones are going to win in the long term. What I do know uh, in terms of television on video iPods or on cell phones is some of my colleagues who said people will never watch television on their computers, and that was within the last 10 years, are now saying, well, people will never watch television on their cell phones. And my now pregnant daughter was waiting for me in a restaurant watching the recent episode of Desperate Housewives on her video iPod. She had paid $1.99 for that download, and that seems at the moment to be a successful business model for Apple. My point simply is that if we accept the fact, and it is a fact, that people will be able to access whatever content they want, whenever they want it, on whatever device they want to display it on, each of these developments is just one more punch mark in that line, but it doesn't change, I would argue, the fundamental nature of their relationship to the media environment at large. And lest I buried my point in, in too many words, that's the phenomenon I don't think we understand yet. If, if uh, young people in particular, and this always goes up in age as the applications become of greater interest to older members of the community, if young people are connected 24-7 to that, those parts of the global consciousness that they want to be connected in what's the role of traditional media. And I don't have the answer to that, and that's what's so, been so provocative over the last day and a half, is to figure out what that role is. What I do know, 
I'll say this. And you may be aware that Rupert Murdoch and News Corp bought MySpace. Now, when Rupert Murdoch gets up in the morning, the first thing on his mind is not, how do I better serve the public interest? There are other players in our society and in other societies who have taken that on as a principal obligation. And without for a moment uh, 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 demeaning the profit motive and why News Corp would have wanted to, forgive the jargon, monetize the traffic on myspace.com, I've got to know that the principal driver there is not to serve the best interests of society and democracy. Someplace in there, as we are working our way toward a definition of the role of public media, it was suggested, as a matter of fact, within the past few hours, that it might be easier to make a list of those things which are not in under the definition of public media, rather than trying to be uh, all-encompassing in our definition of what is under that definition. So to that particular service or technology, who knows? It might be gone in a year, or if you bought their stock, you might be a millionaire. I'll give you my card and <laughs> send me my commission. Yeah. Well, some of the early research, but what we're also seeing is the extent to which it becomes the locus for socialization and social contacts. And I think we're just as when I mentioned the eBay story at a public broadcasting meeting a couple of years ago, somebody came up afterward and said, you know, it's funny, I collect a certain kind of jewelry, and I came to this meeting and flew through Chicago to meet with others I met on eBay because they too collect this jewelry. Uh, there are others in this room who know far more about this research than I do, except to simply observe that there are some countering forces that bring communities together. And I think it's, it's only just begun in terms of trying to figure out what the, what the impact of this is going to be. We certainly read enough horror stories about uh, nasty business that goes on on the web because people are pretending to be people that they are not. Uh, anybody in the room want to com comment on this? Um, the extent to which the internet is a, a, an isolating experience as opposed to, please, yeah. Yeah, one thought that I have at Google is I'm always amazed at the intense need to actually meet face to face with people. You know, Diana, that, I'm Diana Ingram with US Independent. And I also happen to work on a conference with Silver Dust, a documentary festival here in town. But in the documentary filmmaker, Festivals are, first of all, incredibly exciting because they have the opportunity to see their films on the screen. But second of all, there seems to be an equal interest in personal contact with not only peers but industry executives or what have you that somehow the internet isn't quite as fulfilling. I, so. I'm sorry, I'm Andrea Ellis with NBC Network. Um, and I, I was just thinking that sometimes, just like, like with learning, um, just the way people want to interact, it allows you to have those learning levels. Sometimes you just want information. You can do that. And sometimes you want to make personal connections with people who have something in common with you. And it allows you to do that too. So it's like almost with any technology, you're going to have your positive and your negative. So I, I think that's what's interesting. Started as a way to organize your podcasts, so you could, you know, choose new channels and find things based on recommendation. And what they're realizing is a, a much better business model for them than what they're migrating towards. And they have a lot of money as well. Is um, <coughs> letting people share audio with each other. Just drop little short messages on the web uh, and, and send them to 
and somebody else within sort of your pool, uh, and as, as ways of creating communities around sharing audio. So I think there's uh, something that, that, that we in public media can learn from is that uh, commercial enterprises on the internet are making, committing large amounts of money to the bet that people will find each other online through the shared experience of audio, through the shared experience of shared pictures, and certain, uh, you know, there's, there, there are, there's gonna be a equally popular video sharing People are investing a lot of money in this sort of thing, and that's that's where the money is going. Maybe that's that's what we, what we should be thinking about. Yes, I'm back. space already exists. It reminds me of the Pullman uh, rail car company in Chicago that, that basically had their own, you know, their own town that was bought for the, for the, the different individuals. Um, and what was interesting about that, though, is in the physical space, you know, so Gibson says the meat space, as, as it would be, but um, in, that, in that real space, I mean, these people that were, were kind of at the whim of the corporation where they really, if they wanted to, if they wanted, if they, if they wanted to leave or listen to us, they would lose their jobs. But with online communities, what's interesting, what's interesting is that these, these communities already exist. People are coming in and buying them. But if people don't like the way it feels, they can, they can bail. They can go somewhere else. And um, it's interesting to think about in terms of the good corporation and, 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 and how corporations actually do create 
these community spaces, but then ultimately the precipitation is really dependent on the person. So what I'm in, so the, we kind of come to my second part, I'm really interested in the 20-somethings that you're talking to, because I mean, being in, in, in my early 30s, I mean, I'm aware of these communities, but I have no interest in joining them, really. But um, I'd be interested as, you know, in public media, are these people that, that you're talking to at your station, where are they getting their media, where are they getting their news, or their content from? Is it, is it from places like Gather and, and their other kind of, and their, their peers, or are they bringing, you know, traditional media in and then accenting or, or discussing that? Because the big question for me is, you know, at what point in time do we get, do people get so segmented in their own particular, you know, ideas and what, what they want to do that they, they lose? contact with the mainstream of the work. Well, with, with, the, with the, uh, the caveat uh, that the plural of anecdote is not data, <laughs> is not data. I mean, I've been talking to these folks, but I would hardly bring this home as a uh, random sample of uh, people on MySpace or Gather. Uh, they seem to be multitasking all of the time. And so, unlike my mother, who couldn't understand how I could listen to the radio while doing my homework at the same time. They're doing their office work and IMing and online on news sites and also part of these, these social networks. And one of the questions to which I don't have the answer and would love to know if anybody here does, I've put out kind of an APB to some of my colleagues, is whether we know whether people who are multitasking in that way have their brains wired in a different way, whether if, uh, quite serious. Do we know? That's very useful. Some of us have been talking about developing an ADHD TV. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Some very interesting an anecdotals from the, I remember the book written many years ago by Douglas Rashkoff on called Siberia, uh, CY, and uh, he did some interviews with the defense contractors, said they couldn't get a hold of the best programmers because they were all sort of ADD, psychoactive drug users and had no desire to work for the defense industry, but that particular kind of mindset let them deal with vast coding that had simultaneous tasks going on, and then they had to keep it all, all, all at the same time. Sherry Turkle's book, uh, Life on Screen, talks about uh, multiple personality online as not a psychological disorder, but as a rational response to working out your, your, yeah. your, 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 your questions. And this whole thing about linear reading versus um, uh, multi-linear thinking, there's a marvelous article in Harper's many years back. It's a lunch, a dinner time conversation between Neil Paglia and Neil Postman. Uh, <laughs> basically, they put them in, they put them in a... Uh, special dining room in a paste in glass in the middle of the kitchen of a famous restaurant and they transcribe their, their conversation <laughs> and lock the door of course. As, <laughs> as, as they, they announced what each course of the meal was and uh, you know part of his response you know postman saying you know people reading is the linear thinking and if people don't read they lose that ability and part of his response was you know people can walk out of the building and you know can fall on their head life is not linear and so if you are if you walk into a linear think way of thinking you're actually divorcing yourself from reality so it's a very fascinating uh, dichotomy going on there. And, I just think, you know, and, and so a lot of these are not you know, extreme data analysis, but they're very interesting stories that have been published over the years. Thank you. Noel? But it, the title of your talk, which I failed to mention, is that in a global village, where is the public square? And I'm uh, wondering about uh, there, this coincidence that since the 50s, our, we have less and less of a sense of community in our physical space, right? Uh, so says Neil, uh, 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 Robert Putnam. Yeah. And there's a marvelous uh, a rebuttal to that by uh, 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 Wills, Gary Wills, which was written shortly after that article appeared, which needs to be part of the whole record. Anyway, yeah. well, accepting I, Putnam's assertion. I, currently, uh, I live in a real weird community where actually I do know all my neighbors and we know everybody's <laughs> business, but it's very unusual. Before that, I lived in a, a neighborhood for six years. I knew maybe two neighbors. And it seems to be a fact that we know less and less about the people physically around us. But at the same time, and I'm wondering, the question here is, is this a coincidence or a response or something? As our physical, geographic, local communities wither, 
our involvement there? Are people seeking out these virtual communities? So in, in what kind of political effect? Is it good? This, this, is what I, this is what I mean by the, uh, the explosive growth of Craigslist, which is essentially a geographically based service without recognizing that there are new ways in which people are connecting, which Robert Putnam and his folks at the Saguaro Institute would, wouldn't be tracking because it's not the number of people who are enrolled in bowling leagues at the, at the local lanes. Uh, and again, uh, others in the room may be familiar with research on this except to observe that communities of interest seem to be enjoying exponential growth through the internet. Uh, and they may not be measured by the same devices that Putnam used to measure membership in parent-teacher associations or, in his case, you know, not to oversimplify, but bowling leagues and other organized activities. Gary Wills, and I'm not do going to do it justice, one of his principal rejoinders is that the measure that Robert Putnam and his associates used in Bowling Alone to measure uh, social engagement were already uh, becoming in irrelevant as more and more women entered the workplace, and that they were uh, finding attachments and social networking in places that the Bowling Alone folks uh, weren't looking. And I, the Saguaro Institute is up and running, so they may well have been uh, done subsequent research, which some of you may be aware of. Yeah. I can't give you the .org, as I understand it, is the single most frequently visited .org website in the, in the world. Some but is that, is that while people are just sitting right there, you know, they're at their computer watching WGBH and then clicking right through to Oh, this, the, there's no question that everyone who has program-associated websites, if the, if the program engages the curiosity of the viewers, the same with NPR, and Brendan, I'll get to you in a moment, uh, may well, oh, oh, and open source, of course, radio open source would have some experience with this as well, but uh, just to, to answer your question somewhat more completely, if you go to pbs.org slash frontline, there are 60 full-length, hour-long documentaries at that site. Same with NOVA. These are the ones I'm familiar with because I work at GBH, but there is an extraordinary amount of streaming video now available from PBS and NPR continues to find new and innovative ways to complement its radio programming with online features. Uh, I now listen, I'm almost embarrassed to tell you, to about 15 or 20 public radio stations around the country, including one of my favorites, which is, oh, I guess we're, this is on WGBH Forum Network, <laughs> uh, KCRW from Santa Monica, which has a wonderful, wonderful mix of uh, music and features, including their morning show called Morning Becomes Eclectic, the format of which has not been copied so far as I know elsewhere in the country. So that even I, as a, a user, and I'm not that much of a techie, I'm not wearing a beeper, um, <laughs> uh, have turned more and more frequently to broadband because of the range of choices it, it, uh, it provides. And public broadcasters have been among the principal drivers of that use, although hardly alone in that space. Brendan would know more than I. Well, I just want to turn this question, if I may, back to you as an extended focus group. What are your own experiences in the use of uh, broadband or the internet in terms of audio and video uh, programming as well as text? Yeah. Uh, so you have your laptop in your lap while you watch? Sometimes, yes. Um, actually, most of the week. Um, and uh, where I actually I work in a communications strategy.
kind of dynamic is really is really valuable. Uh, it's kind of like the way I envision you know sort of virtual conference or where you know we have people in the room here, but we could have hundreds and hundreds of people around the country that are participating by watching the stream simultaneously to posting information on a, on a, on a discussion forum that somebody's monitoring and adding a question to the discussion. And, uh, and how do, how does Food Network measure up on that criterion? It varies from show to show. Um, some show, um, some show it's, it's, it's kind of the, the one that's a little bit fuzzy to me is that is Dave Lieberman's show with a, a New York personal chef that I mean, keeps re his commercials keep referring to information on his on, on his web page. And I go to the web page and the information he says is supposed to be there is only there in video format, which is useless to me because I can't get to it right away. I don't know which one to go to. I don't know what time period to get to. I want to know. And he says, I've got this list of you know great wines under ten dollars. I'm looking for the list and it's not there. Uh, it's embedded in a video. And so, uh, so, that's, uh, so it's ironic that the one show that seems to be driving people to do it isn't living up to the thing it's selling. So what you need is better meta tagging. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. The other thing is just to go back to what you were saying yeah. earlier, uh, television stations, uh, you know, putting video clips on, on the internet is, is the digital version of that, uh, that cable that was going to guide balloons around the nation. <laughs> 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 Way of looking at what you have and, and recreating it on a, in a completely new medium that does unbelievable other things. Yeah, this, this is technology, um, Vodium developed this a while back, where they would take video clips and then they would transcribe it and then they would hyperlink the, trans the transcript so that you could scroll through the transcript to whatever you want. You would be able to the table of contents and jump to it. Click on that, you can cue the video up and start playing. And, yeah. and that kind of interactivity, yeah. I think, is what's going to happen. That's a technology that existed if you go to a Google Video, which is still in, in beta, although I think they launched officially last Friday, they have taken the captioning, which is on many programs for the hearing impaired, and they use that, to Pat's point, as the meta tags so that you can search the content according to the, uh, the, the captions on the program. It's the same way that the uh, Vanderbilt University News Archives has been archiving network television news for the better part of 15 years now. Yes, news hour. there was another, and the news hour as well. As a living, and I make films for the, in the, for the traditional watching as a hobby, but I'm interested right now in current TV, because traditionally you had public access, which was just kind of like everybody who had an ambition to get on TV had a show, and you had public television, which was very sophisticatedly tailored programming offered from an author to an audience. And I feel like current TV is kind of like a cool blend of the two. The for, for those who may not know, could you do a brief description of what current, what current TV is? If you, if you go to current.tv, um, there's a lab, and then there's a viewing section. You can go and watch clips that are all under five minutes long. You can go into the lab and upload your own videos. So if you're an independent filmmaker or just somebody, some kids sitting around the house with some video equipment, and you think your stuff could be entertaining or engaging to an audience, you can upload your clips, and they can go on public display and get voted on. So if you go to current.tv, you can go and you can vote on which clips you like, and you'll see rankings of which ones are getting higher and higher. And then Current TV has a cable station where they show the ones that get the highest ranking on, as, as their programming. So how, I'm interested from like the people who work in public television, if they're interested in that model, if they're thinking about doing anything with that, because that seems like the real like public square sort of interaction. The fact, the fact that you can interact with your TV, you can make your own programming if you don't like what you're seeing, which is always my situation, <laughs> aside from PBS. <laughs> no, I, 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 I can, can report that a number of us are working with a startup called the Open Media Network, omn.org, uh, which is creating a community environment in which people can uh, self-publish audio, video, uh, text, and also have the kind of community ratings and categorization schemes that would enable those who have interest in certain kinds of content to find it relatively easily, and also to know how their peers have and uh, others in the community have rated that content. It's the official launch is scheduled for March, but it's omn.org. How do you, do you see yourself competing with current.tv, or do you see yourself as part of an additional part of a movement that's going to happen to television. 
Well, I think everybody who puts content out into the marketplace is competing for time and attention. Um, my personal preference is to, to make content available as widely and as broadly as possible because that's the way the public interest is best served. That then becomes tempered by, as you know, by whatever the uh, business model is that supports the content and what rights can be cleared, which continues to be a major challenge for all of us. So this is evolving over time. But uh, my admonition to my colleagues when they say, should we keep this only on one site or should we put it out there, is go play in traffic. Go where the people are. And if you can find a lot of people at a lot of different sites, uh, make sure that they can at least link to your content so that they can discover it as they're uh, wandering around. Uh, well, you've given me a terrific opportunity to give a plug for our most recent research. Thank you so much. <laughs> One of the things that our center did uh, last year was to work with filmmakers to create a uh, uh, collective statement by them, and Grace Gillingham was one of the participants. Um, the uh, collective statement on what they believe are fair and reasonable terms of fair use, and it also allowed us to create a website on our on our center website that uh, provides clarification on uh, what you need to clear and what you don't need to clear, what's in the public domain, and uh, what things are off the table. For instance, trademarked material, unless you are directly competing, is not an issue. So signage is not an issue. Um, so um, you, you could go there and, and get some clarification on what's, uh, what's legal to do and what you have a right to claim. But uh, I think that what you're pointing to is, is there, there's sort of, I, I think there are a, a cluster of rights problems. And, and one of them is people making stuff and trying to launch it into a, a larger circuit that involves commercial transactions that raises questions about can you do, have you observed all the rights clearances? Which has raised a, a, an attitude among some people that's like, well, screw it, what do I care? Um, and that's, that's not a viable attitude if you are actually going to deal with people who deal commercially. And, and the, the, other, the, uh, the other end of the spectrum is the problem that I know that David and, and WGBH are extremely familiar with, which is uh, you are working within the confines of a gate-kept environment, and you uh, have products that have a n layers and layers and layers of rights cleared for different times, and you would like to reuse them, and how will you do that? And that's actually a, a project of the Center for the following year. But yes, it's a huge problem. <laughs> And, and you probably have much more to say about it. Um, not at the moment. No. <laughs> all, all I can say is if they were remaking The Graduate these days and the guy walked over to Dustin Hoffman and whispered in his ear, he would say, rights. <laughs> <laughs> Other questions? Just one yes. Um, I'm Phil Robert from the Scribe Media Center in Pittsburgh. Um, I was actually just wondering, maybe this is more pedestrian than other questions, but if there's any funding sources opening up for like new media for both individual artists and the community center and that kind of thing. We often serve people who aren't really even, you know, the internet is still not a really viable form of communication for them. Or do we have too many filters in place? So, I mean, I think that's one thing that's really lacking. Well, one of the, one of the subjects that we touched upon in the conversations over the last day and a half are uh, emerging and alternative uh, business models. Uh, whether you could make some of these uh, services uh, self-sustaining based on the interests of those uh, intended beneficiaries who value the services that are being provided. So rather than it being based solely on, say, grants from foundations or corporations, uh, the media, as you know, are allowing uh, an extraordinary fragmentation of audience but also allows the targeting to specific constituencies to solicit support for the services that they wanted. To see. One of our participants was uh, from the, uh, why am I blanking on, on his name, the uh, presidential campaign of Howard. Dean. Yes, Dean. Howard Dean, thank you. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> right. um, and there and moveon.org, other similar, as you know, online initiatives have found new ways to speak directly to interested uh, participants to find the funding from them themselves. Not, not easy answers, uh, 
but lest it be lost on us, the Google advertising model, to carry a flag for that idea for the moment, is remarkable in that it addresses the concern that was first expressed by the first department store magnate in Chicago in the mid-1800s who stated famously, I know that half my advertising works, but I just don't know which half. And the Google advertising model turns the whole thing 180 degrees on its head. And because of the way the sponsored links are organized alongside pages of subject matter, which the visitor himself or herself has said, I'm interested in that stuff. Suddenly, those who show up on those sites and see these sponsored links have raised their hand, essentially, and said, I'm interested in those subjects. Uh, speaking parochially, GBH has a corporate underwriter for a, uh, a website which talks about podcasting 101, and it's sponsored by a company that does software for people who are in IT. They have had they say, an astonishing 4% click-through rate from those who go to this podcast site and click on their link. And in the internet world, that's an astonishing response rate. Because those who have gone to that site have essentially raised their hands and said, we're, we're, we are, we're geeks or we're into this technology. And they have an audience which is pre-qualified for that purpose. You may be aware that TiVo is using the same kinds of techniques for targeting advertising to interested consumers. The good news here, not to be overly Pollyannish about it, is my line, having been in direct mail fundraising, is always that junk mail is direct mail in which you have no interest. <laughs> and so for my wife, junk mail are, is all the tool catalogs I get. And for me, junk mail are all the clothing catalogs that she gets. But for her, it's direct mail that speaks to her interest, as it is for me, and if we can begin to focus that, this previously bothersome advertising content may indeed turn out to be a service that speaks to our, our personal interests. And that's one of the upside opportunities for those who are looking for support for their media activities. Can you get to those constituents who would have an interest in supporting it? Yeah. commercial and universally available. But yet, um, I'm not an expert in this, but it seems that the, the trend in, in the hyper media environment that we're encountering is uh, towards commercialization, towards monetization and a subscription model. What, what is the role, do you think, for, for public media in, in this future environment if, uh, if, if public media maintains its character? Well, I'm, I'm among the right to access to telephone service, that it is uh, imperative to the society as a whole that access to those distribution media, at least at some basic level, be guaranteed to all, to all citizens. I, I'm not sufficiently involved in regulatory work or politics, and you're closer to that, and you're closer to that, to know whether that's realistic or, or, or not, although the idea continues to surface on Capitol Hill, and maybe one of these days there will be universal access to broadband. It is such a demonstrable driver of economic development, we were talking about this earlier today, that it would seem to be in the interests of the country to facilitate universal uh, access to broadband and hopefully to have public media organizations use that as a distribution platform. The early signs of the struggle, so as you're probably aware, Drew, uh, in Pennsylvania, the uh, city of Philadelphia, wanted to provide uh, free wireless access to all the citizens. And Verizon, and correct me if I've got the story wrong, went to the legislature to try to prevent cities in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania from offering free broadband. And they were partially successful in having legislation passed that said the city of Philadelphia couldn't do it within its boundaries, but the uh, restriction now applies elsewhere in the Commonwealth. But those tensions are going to continue to play out as more and more municipalities, and this is not that unusual, see broadband access as a principal driver of economic development. It's happening in the South Bronx, I know, through from colleagues at WNET. 
So yeah, I think those services should continue to be universally available, along with uh, a whole panoply of other services that could be delivered the same way. Mm -hmm. 